I'm Vinny Politan. Great to have you with us tonight here on Closing Arguments. And take a breath. We have a lot to get to in this show tonight. There are stories around the nation. Of course, we're on top of all of them. But let's begin with the trial that we have been covering. Robert Durst on the stand once again. More cross-examination today. But what an important day. Because today we were actually talking about Susan Berman. She's the victim in the case. I mean, this whole trial is about the murder of Susan Berman. And today on cross-examination, um, John Lewin, the prosecutor, questioning Robert Durst, questioning him again, pointing out inconsistencies, giving him hypotheticals. It was the, a, a lot of what we've been seeing. But the significance of this is that this goes to the ultimate issue. This is it. This is what the case is about. Let's take a look. I want to go back, Mr. Durst, to your testimony that you believed that the killer was still in the house when you were there, correct? The killer might have been in the house when I was there, yes. Well, you previously testified that you believed the killer was in the house, correct? I think I testified that I believed he might be in the house. Would you agree, Mr. Durst, that you are aware, as you testify today, that it is in your interest to try to make it appear that Susan died as close to the time you found her as possible? Would you agree? That's argumentative. No, I would not agree. So is it your contention that Susan Berman was killed by somebody who was in the house while you were there or around the time that you got there? Is that your contention? I said the killer might have been in the house when I arrived. Would you agree, Mr. Durst, that given your observations about Susan's cold face and the black looking blood that if the killer were in the house it would appear as if they stayed there a long time after they killed her I have no idea and when you're saying that you believe the killer might have been in the house are you saying also that you think the killer killed her while you were there The killer might have been in the house. I never said anything about the killer killing Susan Berman while I was there. Mr. Durst, is there a reason why, given all the details you gave, that you have no memory of making the decision to write the cadaver note at the house and then getting the paper envelope and stamps from Susan's? I definitely, absolutely did not write the cadaver note in the house. Now, my question is, though, is if you've said that you might have gotten the paper, the envelope, and the stamp from Susan's house, correct? You might have. Is that right? I do not recall getting a stamp from Susan's house. I do not recall getting a stamp anywhere. And I do not recall where I got the envelope. In the SUV, I had writing paper and a pen. Did you have an envelope and a stamp in the SUV? No. So, Mr. Durst, I want you to assume that the stamps that were inside of Susan's house were the same kind of stamp as you had on the cadaver note. So my question to you would be, Could you have gotten the stamp from inside the house? Objection to the uh, improper uh, hypothetical evidence. Uh, Sustained. There it is. There it is. The cadaver note once again. uh, I still can't believe this this is a thing. A cadaver note. It is. All right. Court TV legal correspondent Chanley Painter joins us live today from Los Angeles County, California. Chanley, great to see you. The cadaver note once again. Entering the center stage, I always thought it was the most important part of this whole thing. Um, Tell us about today. 
Yeah, I agree with you. The strongest piece of evidence the prosecution has against Robert Durst, because remember, like the prosecutor reminded the jury today on cross-examination, Robert Durst denied writing this cadaver note for two decades before his defense team actually entered a stipulation saying, yes, he was the one who wrote that note. Remember, this is the note that is addressed to the Beverly Hills Police Department. It has Susan Berman's address on it and the word cadaver. Well, today the prosecutor reminded the jury about the denials to further show inconsistent stories and to contest his credibility. Let's watch the portion of, of today where the prosecutor played the jinx. First of all, somebody had a plan to do this, they had to go to her house, uh, do what they did. I mean, if I were to rob somebody or burglarize the house, I wouldn't, if you, if you didn't take men in Susie's, then they wouldn't have picked Susie because there was nothing there of value. I mean, a silver jewelry was there. I have no idea if she hid it, but that's the wrong house to burglarize. And, and now you're taking this big risk. What's the risk? What? Which, which big risk? You're writing a note to the police that only the killer could have written. So, I, I just, uh, somebody would have to be my, my rabbi, although I don't see him getting involved in any kind of a killing, he might feel that it's that important that, the, that it be buried right away. But I think you've got to be pretty, pretty, pretty Jewish, religious, to feel that way. There you have Robert Durst saying only the killer of Susan Berman could have written the cadaver note. That was his contention in the Jinx Donkey series, Vinny, as well as during that 2015 interrogation by the prosecutor. And Durst's answer or explanation to that is that he, Andrew Jarecki, the director of the Jinx, was the one who told him to say that. And when asked about, well, what about our interview in 2015, he said, I was working on those plea negotiation discussions at that time. That's why I maintained that story. It's unbelievable. You know, the other thing that's really striking about showing that video is you see a different Robert Durst, right? It, it's still years after um, the murder, but he, he looks much more um, capable of it than he does in the courtroom. A, a complete contrast. It really is, and this was something that I think benefits the prosecution's case when they keep playing these video clips. Not only does it re-engage the jurors' attention who have been sitting now through uh, the seventh day of cross-examination today, so they are alerted, they look up at the screen, they, they see this, but earlier when the prosecutor played that exact clip, Benny, Durst was not really answering the way that the prosecutor wanted, and at one point the prosecutor says, well, I can play that again and you can re-listen to what you said. He says, sure, play it again. So then the jury, jury got to see the exact clip just a couple minutes later and see Robert Durst as he was back in 2000, I think that's 2012 or 13. Yeah. Un un unbelievable. All right, Chanley, stand by. we got more questions for you, but let's bring in our think tank tonight. Joining us in the Bronx, New York, criminal defense attorney Renee Hill in Los Angeles, California, where all this has taken place. Larry Uretzian is with us. And in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, criminal defense attorney, civil rights attorney. Okay, see you early. Great to see everyone. Uh, Renee Hill, so uh, let me start just with the jury seeing a younger Robert Durst. I mean, to me, it's, it's night and day, and he's even, you know, that's even many years removed from, from the murder, but it's, it's a, he's a different guy. Yeah, absolutely. Good evening to everyone, first of all. Um, but yes, Vinny, I, I was looking at that and saying to myself, wow, what a difference. And I wonder how much that affects the jury. Does it, does it uh, fare in Robert's favor? that they see how frail he really is now and, and looking at, you know, how he appeared so many years before. Um, it is a stark difference between then and now. And, uh, it, you know, it makes you feel, feel sorry for him. There's a lot of sympathy, I think. You know, it might not be enough to have him acquitted, but uh, <laughs> given the evidence that's starting to come out finally today, but um, it, it really gives the jurors, you know, something to think about here. Back then, he was he he was smart. He was quick, and he still has his wit about him today. But you can tell, you know, he just is so much more debilitated here. Yeah, I think now he, he you know he can 
come across as being like that kooky old guy. I, I just felt like he, he seemed more sinister in those video clips. But that's just me, the former prosecutor, looking at it, Lara. Uh, other people may see it another way. I understand it. Um, the cadaver note. Lara, there's a thing called the cadaver note. They call it the cadaver note in court all the time. It, it's almost, it's almost oh, yeah, the old cadaver note. But to me, that is, uh, th that's it. That's it. 20 years he lied about it. Only the killer could have written it. He's like writing the closing argument for the prosecutor, Lara. He is. I got to give it to you, uh, Vinny. This, this is pretty strong evidence that's going to go against him. And, and the jury is going to be focusing on that. We all know that. Unless they believe that he may have lied about that for other reasons because he was afraid that someone may implicate him and he's just talking. But his own words, unfortunately, can come back to haunt him. We all know it. But again... It, it, the bottom line in this case is going to be, is the jury going to like him and is the jury going to believe him and how credible is he coming across? Or is the prosecutor, by spending all this time, seven days of beating up on this frail-looking man who doesn't look like he could have killed someone, is going to come back to haunt the prosecution? Yes, showing some of these older videos probably help because the jury can see that, you know, Maybe he's beating up on this man the way he looks now, but the real person he's beating up on is that man in the video, the one who was capable of murder. So there's a lot of play. It's going to come down to believability, credibility, and what the jury is going to, how much the jury is going to like the defendant. Yeah, I, I guess. I, I... KC, let me ask you, uh, what we've experienced for the last seven days, is it elder abuse or is it just great cross-examination? <laughs> It's about time, first and foremost. I mean, I'm glad that the judge took control of, over his courtroom, but he should have done that a long time ago, number one. But it's about time. Wait, that you, you don't want the judge to let the lawyers just try the case? Isn't oh, that gosh. what we want as lawyers? Oh, a judge who says, listen, I'm going to let no. you guys try your case. Not at all. There needs to be control in the courtroom, and the jury has to know that the judge is in control at all times. Even when an objection is posed and the judge has, uh, sustains that objection, there's no need for argument back and forth. That's total disrespect for the court, number one. But I'm glad that the prosecutor has finally honed in on the important inconsistencies and not inconsistencies that really doesn't matter, goes, goes to the heart of the case. And, you know, what I saw today was a shift. Throughout this entire trial, especially in the beginning of cross-examination, I felt sorry for Mr. Durst. I felt that he was going to get away with murder. But the prosecution brought out three important points. And those three points, number one, was the, Jew the Jewish traditional burial. You can't assume that the jury knows about that. And also the lock, the phone, and the cold breath, not the cold body. When he honed in on those three things, I started to think, you know what? These inconsistencies are adding up, but he should have... Uh, had a stronger cross-examination and ended strong. So hopefully he'll end strong and prosecution will get their uh, verdict of guilty. I want to play some more of the cross-examination here, talking about um, Susan Berman and Morris Black. And the prosecutor saying Susan Berman, Morris Black, both dead because they knew too much. Take a listen. So if Susan Berman is out there, and she's telling people, as you've said, that you killed your wife, you told her that, and that she helped you cover it up. If Janine Pirro is looking to charge you, if Janine Pirro talks to Susan Berman, then that's going to mean that Janine Pirro can basically say, I've got Bob Durst's best friend who's been out there for years saying he killed his wife and helped cover it up. Would you agree that even if Susan's statement is untrue, just her going around and saying it and you being aware of it is a tremendous threat to you. I think that if Susan was formally interviewed, in, interviewed, the person doing the interviewing would decide that she's not reliable. He knew about the reinvestigation, correct? Correct. And since he knew about the reinvestigation, Mr. Durst, he also knew before that that you were wealthy, correct? Correct. And he knew that you were very afraid about being charged by Janine Pirro, correct? Correct. You were so concerned about Janine Pirro 
that you would actually set up a second residence in Louisiana, in New Orleans, also where you had disguised yourself as a woman. Correct? Correct. All right, talk a little bit there about Morris Black. That was the guy that he dismembered. He killed and dismembered, but was found not guilty of murder. Let's bring back in Chanley Painter, Court TV legal correspondent. Um, you know, I guess this prosecutor is trying to do what they couldn't do in Galveston, which is convince a jury that he murdered Morris Black. Exactly what I was thinking inside the courtroom today, because really taking on the murder, he characterizes it in court as the murder of Morris Black. He doesn't hold back, and that's what I was thinking. And as detailed as Prosecutor Lewin is, Lewin is he has his 200-page outline, Vinny, that he's not even halfway through, by the way. Uh, He's going into detail and getting into some nitty gritty detail, even about the types of handguns this afternoon. Some of the jurors seemed a bit tired, maybe had their eyes closed for an extended amount of time this afternoon with that testimony. But finally, he is broaching these issues of Galveston and Morris Black. I, I want to mention that the judge did allow him a little more time for cross-examination, Vinny. He will have until next Wednesday to complete really re-prosecuting the Morris Black death. Wednesday. Okay. Okay. Uh, originally, he was negotiating just trying to get Monday, but by the end of Thursday, he gets all the way till next Wednesday. Exactly. The, he got his days back, so he seemed happy about that, and you could tell because he was really, again, taking his time today, getting into some of the weeds and some of the inconsistencies still back on the same pattern. All right. So, eight. Okay. Let me quickly go to the think tank. Um, uh, That'll be, I think, 10 days of cross-examination. What's the longest you've ever done, Renee? Uh, longest cross-examination? Or maybe, examination. Maybe. Or, or an examination of a witness? Probably three days. Three days. Lara? I can't even remember, but not <laughs> this many days, that's for sure. Maybe a couple of days. Casey, Double I'm digits? Just two. Two. Just there you two. go. <laughs> All right.